Television. Hey Dolores, have you heard about the D-List? It's the show where Dave lists things and his name begins with a D. Mitch, we are trapped in the body of some dork who makes videos on the internet. Now is not the time. On April 1st, 2015, podcast listeners rejoiced as Pontania Nation with Paul F. Tompkins premiere. In some ways a spiritual successor to Paul's earlier podcast, the Pod F. Tomcast, the show is a wondrous combination of so many of the esteemed Mr. Tompkins' revered skills. Stream of conscious monologues, delightful conversation, surreal improv, eccentric characters, and a knack for surrounding himself with wonderful and talented friends, including some of the best improvisers in town and musician extraordinaire Evan Schletter, who is only... the best? Spontanea Nation quickly established itself as not only one of the funniest podcasts of all time, but also one of the very best monthly live shows in LA, one that I personally attend absolutely every time I can. And in honor of a wonderful year of this delightful show, I thought it only fitting to count down my favorite episodes thus far. And boy, oh boy, was this difficult to narrow down. This easily, easily could have been a top 53 episodes list. But after re-listening to the entire series for the countless time, I finally managed to whittle it down to my top 20 episodes. I'm leaving out over half the series. This was a huge challenge. Number 20. Episode 1, A Denny's Parking Lot. Oh, that's right. This podcast was amazing from the very first episode. Paul chats with his fellow work juice player Busy Phillips about comfort food, raising children, and a chain restaurant called Aho Al's. Do you think maybe Aho Al uh, means baked rat? <laughs> no. What if it did? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. And then Janet Varney, Craig Kukowski, and Matt Gorley join Paul to tell a rather touching story of a lost high school love reunited in the dumpster of a Denny's parking lot. Bobby, do you want to get in the dumpster with me, or...? Yeah, sure. I'm curious as to what it feels like. The story also involves an annoying ex with a misguided entrepreneurial spirit. Auntie Pusarello, are you kidding me? Yeah. That's the girl that invented the beanbag chair filled with chips. A young manager so evil that he gets his kicks from selling dog skeletons. But once you get the taste for it, you don't stop, you know what I'm saying? A mysterious helper named Rumple Dumpskin. And I will grant you three wishes. And a dumpster magnate philanthropist who saves the day in the end. I wonder if I could uh, uh, talk to you about a business term. A business term. A business term. <laughs> sure, like macroeconomics? Yeah, or? well, no, no, no. <laughs> One thing that Janet and Craig in particular both excel at is an expert use of callbacks, taking concepts and little turns of phrase from all of the pre-improv setup and peppering them throughout the story with precision. I have uh, zero facts about <laughs> what atrocities EDI mean. <laughs> Performed. Performed? <laughs> what word am I looking for? I'm excited to join the Spontanea Nation. Craig, And thank perform you. some improv atrocities. Thank you. No <laughs> oh! The atrocity you performed on my heart! See? When you combine that with Matt's knack for surreal non sequitur, you get a recipe for a story that does feel grounded in everything that set it up, but still feels unpredictably insane. Number 19, episode 48 Laundromat. The superhumanly delightful Judy Greer talks about good New Year's resolutions, learning to get around LA, and finances. Basically all the struggles of being a working actor. Then Jessica Chaffin, Mark McConville, and Annie Savage tell the story of a young woman trying to get her laundry done, but no matter what she tried, she can't get change. Why don't we just walk outside, just go through the front door, okay. and then you can ask me just as a person. And not as an employee. It's sort of like oh. I'm taking off my badge, kind of. Oh, oh, I appreciate that so yeah. much. Thank you, yeah. Uh, do you have any quarters on you? Oh, let me just check. No. What the fuck? This causes a disturbance in the neighborhood. I liked it so much better when there was a library was next not door. like this before the riffraff moved in with the laundromat. Which escalates even further when the laundromat owner's shady affairs come to light. The laundromat owner's wife found out about me and my semi-employee boning him. Annie Savage's characters always tend to have an endearing quality, a certain innocence that makes you root for them, even if they suddenly take a slight shift for the unexpectedly cruel. I thought we agreed that we're gonna live together forever and always be in law. I wish we just stayed in our separate houses and just broke up. As a contrast, Jessica Chaffin's characters in this episode start off seemingly cruel on the surface, but one of them becomes surprisingly sympathetic as we discover more about her sad life. What? Honey, I'm gonna go to work now. Oh, uh, well, make sure you're home <laughs> to make dinner later. Oh. 
You love the way I cook. Her other character is pretty much just a jerk, but you know. What's my name, lad? <laughs> uh, Maureen? Wrong! <laughs> and of course, Mark McConville always knows just how to give a scene the exact push it needs to get to the most wonderfully silly place. And if the president finds out we're stealing his documents, we're in serious trouble. Number 18. Episode 10. The Student Lounge at a Performing Arts High School. After a monologue that features an appearance from Paul's most beloved character... My name is Jarls. ...and a surprising amount of O. Henry discussion... I'm O. Henry, creator of the most ironic candy bar. Paul chats with Justin Kirk about murdering jellyfish and walking among the gooey ducks while living in a small northwest town, then moving to go study theater at an early age. This interview is actually rather historical, as Justin is the first to break a pattern among Spontanean Asian guests. Look! You are on trial here. <laughs> <laughs> then Chris Tallman, Sarah Burns, and Matt Gorley join Paul to improvise the story of a group of performing arts high school students prepping for their performance of Hamlet. But things get tense as life starts to imitate art. Then I say we take it to the stage tonight in our opening performance of Hamlet. In the big sword duel, we'll use axes, poison-tipped axes. Chris Tallman has an amazing talent for playing characters who are larger than life, both physically and metaphorically, often with a gruff, almost monstrous aspect to them. And Chris's talent for gruff characters comes in very handy when he plays, so far the only recurring character on Spontanean Nation not played by Paul. Now listen you son of a bitch, I know you're gonna be playing this part, but you better study it like a motherfucker. I have taken the liberty of memorizing the entire play of not just my lives, but everybody else's lives. You know, I'm a set of teachers, a similar situation, but me and I Joe can't, Beth. I cannot make out what you're saying at all. Joe Beth Williams! And from what I've been told, Matt Gorley is doing extended bits of Hamlet from memory. That's amazing. No wonder he never bothered to learn basketball. He's too busy memorizing all of Shakespeare. Though thou hast but rosemary time in thy wreath, thou canst bequeath thyself to the early grave by giving such love to a bastard like Hamlet. I feel like I'm um, going insane. <laughs> Don't, that's not the line. But it's like the general idea of what's happening. Like... What she means to quote is this. <laughs> she, what laundered souls have come clean <laughs> in the heavens when, when faced with death as the such we have, right? Like faced with death and the such we have. Number 17, episode 26, Garden of Eden. Paul chats with Hot Wives star Timberly Hill about bad advice, if Castaway was a ripoff of Bob Newhart, navigating the awkward world of sex as a high schooler, world records, shark attacks, and lightning strikes. A wild ride of a chat. Then Janet Varney and No You Shut Up's Victor Yurid and Colleen Smith go back to the Garden of Eden to witness the first moments of humanity, but things are a little different than you remember them. I'm Adam. <sighs> Oh, I'm uh, Ami, so nice to... That's hey guys, I I'm Cheryl. Oh, hi. Oh. Hi, hi, Cheryl. <laughs> so much so that two Columbos and a Kojak are on the case. Hey, there's no cold cases, only cold hearts and murderers. Also, I've been alive for a long time. Memory serves, I played an angel in something that... And after that's when things get really insane. And somehow it all comes around to some of my favorite people from comedy playing characters from my favorite movie, which was so unexpected and made me happier than you can possibly imagine. Why don't you make like a lamp and turn off? Number 16, episode two, A Mechanic's Garage. Starting off with a soliloquy that involves a surprising amount of baby discussion. Babies, there's gotta be a better way. Paul has a delightful chat with Michael McMillian where he asks him what age he sees himself as. This leads to many wonderful tangents on topics such as injuries sustained in the line of clowning. Uh, I once uh, saw a good friend uh, dislocate his shoulder while pretending to be fire. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I almost want to stop everything right now. <laughs> the deep questions about Batman. Who <laughs> you think Bruce Wayne, the Batman? Yes. In the comical books. Mm -hmm. You think he's in his late twenties? Yes. And a magical place called Exchange City. This sounds like Settlers of Catan yes. mixed with the Stanford yes. prison experiment. <laughs> yes. And then Paul is joined by Shuley Cowan, Mark McConville, and Mark Evan Jackson to improvise a wonderfully callback-laden story about a dispute over the price of a rearview mirror. 
The customer tries to rush things along to get back to his very important job. You're a doctor? A an obstetrician. So, yes? And as one would expect, the dispute erupts into a dance competition. What is your history with the art form of dance? I don't know how to do it. <laughs> do you feel that puts you at a disadvantage in a yes. dance competition? <laughs> yes. This episode was a fantastic showcase for the performer's versatility, as they each played one main character throughout the story, but also several smaller side characters who kept popping in and out. I'm Kurt Menefee, your play-by-play -play man for the dance-off. In this episode, more than any other, I found myself constantly forgetting that there were only four improvisers. Let me just say, there's no one I have a crush on. And each side character would easily be the best part of any other story they appeared in. Now, Digsby, who do you award that round to? I'm really more concerned about the physical elements of the competition coming up next. That part was primarily dancing. All right, so... Did you answer the question? Bonus points to this episode for including the first of many improvised musical numbers, the most patriotic national anthem of all. Number 15, episode 13, a dental convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. The first live episode of the podcast recorded at Largo at the Coronet. I made sure to attend this taping because I knew it would be one historical event. And oh, how very right I was. Thank you all for being here at this first live version of the five episodes old podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Spontaneous Nation, sponsored as always by Hubris. Not only was it the first live episode, but it was also the first time that the interview guests joined in on the improv. And it was the show that forever caused us all to associate a hand gesture with Jeremy Piven. Pivnania Nation, I believe, is the new uh, title Pivnania of this Pivnania Nation! Right? <laughs> what a dystopian future. The question for Colin is simple. Why did you choose that outfit today? <laughs> Naturally, this question leads to a discussion of the time Colin and his friends took ecstasy before a baseball game, which kicked in just in time to hear John Lovett sing the national anthem. It's America's pastime. Of all the things <laughs> I did not think I would be talking about. <laughs> well, you chose that outfit. <laughs> Then Craig Kukowski, Mark Evan Jackson, and Janet Varney join Paul to improvise the story of the dental convention in Scottsdale, Arizona on the hottest day of the year. You know what I love about this restaurant? It's in a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the hospital is within a convention center. Yeah. Ordinary dentists enjoy the buffet while dressed as crustaceans, as they are prone to do. Uh, orthodonture, my specialty. Oh, uh, I do that thing where uh, you knock teeth out with a little hammer. <laughs> But all is not well as the dentist gets some shocking news. The fabled dental pearl found in a filling? It's... It's... <laughs> it's Mercer. <laughs> the story takes us on side trips through Narnia... Excuse me, I don't have an appointment, but I am Aslan. <laughs> <laughs> A poker game. Every time we play one of these card games with the announcer, you always win. The watchful eye of a mysterious helper. I'm the hotel detective for this hospital convention center. <laughs> and the second most patriotic national anthem of all. Mr. 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 John, 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 John. It's hard to claim that either the live episodes or the studio episodes are inherently superior to each other, but it's easy to see that they have different energies, and I look forward to many more of both. And if you're ever able to, you definitely need to see the live show in person. It's quite an experience. Number 14. Episode 47, Pediatrician's Office. Not to be confused with episode 43, A Pediatrician's Waiting Room, although that episode is also great. Look, every Spontanea Nation episode is great, okay? Due to a last-minute scheduling hiccup, the interview guest is Earwolf Guy with many titles that relate to being in charge, Adam Sachs, who has asked, what about baseball? Naturally, most of the discussion is about living in India. 
Then Janet Varney and Craig and Carla Kukowski share the story of the people waiting to see a pediatrician. A deep-voiced teenager obsessed with soap operas who wants to reunite with his dad. I could be up for a daytime Emmy. And a mother and daughter separated by religious zealotry. Well, you know, I know a bit about trials and tribulations from my study of scripture. Oh, Mom, please don't do that here. Well, it's important that they know. The story veers in wonderful directions as always, including a delightful look back at the first ever radio soap opera, I'll Try Living Tomorrow. Well, I'll take a gun, thank you. I'll take a gun as well. Wait, both of you. Before you have a duel, make sure you have a little bit of malta meal in your stomach. Malta meal, it's delicious breakfast. Malta meal, delicious breakfast. Everything you need in a box of shit. Not that any of this episode's participants had years of experience performing old-timey radio dramas in their commercials. Number 13. Episode 17, Science Fair. Frank and Sadie Doyle reunite as Paul chats with Paget Brewster about making a food-based amendment to the Constitution, which naturally leads to discussion of Sylvester Stallone, cannibalism, and creepy parental behavior. Then Craig Kukowski and stars from the Pistol Shrimps field Amanda Lund and Maria Blasucci join Paul for a story set at Science Fair. Not a Science Fair. Or a Science Fair in a specific place, just Science Fair. The story focuses on a young girl, her dad, and her teacher who find the hope to just maybe become a family after working on a science diagram of dad's balls. Yep. I present to you today at the 2016 Science Fair this... You can do it, honey. I'm so proud of you. ...diagram of my dad's <laughs> veiny balls. There are also several side characters, including two boys who just want to sabotage everyone. We could use this to our advantage if we bring it up to the school board that there's an impropriety going on and that our science fair project will win. Science fair scandal. So <laughs> throw back a bottle of beer. Two girls who could become outcasts if their dark secret gets out. Come on, just tell me what you did. I ate a whole roll of quarters. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Tim Gunn and Heidi Klum. This was like Project Funway. What's that mean? Somebody wrote that for me. I don't... I... Number 12. Episode 33, TV News Control Room. Paul chats with fellow comedian named Paul who hosts an Earwolf podcast, Paul Shear, about what it would be like to quantum leap slash being John Malkovich yourself into Charlie Sheen. This is the kind of question that I would get an A plus in in college because I really thought outside the box. <laughs> as well as what it's like being a new father. You know, the two topics man has always wrestled with. Then the Pauls join Aaron Hayes and Work Juice players Mark Evan Jackson and Hal Loveland for the story of the day-to-day -day struggles of Machete Falls TV news control room on a seemingly slow news day. Literally nothing happened today. Uh, there's, I don't know what I we're know. gonna, we've got, we've got 22 and a half minutes of air to fill. And only 14 minutes until we start that 22 minutes. I love that the initial central conflict of the story is the fact that there was no conflict and it's resolved by basically just utter chaos erupting. We want to say, Goodbye to a departing member of our staff who is the little baby Molly who has been inhabiting the body of Donna, our executive producer, I want to say. The whole episode was great, and even if it hadn't been, it would still get Hall of Fame status for the perfect news anchor name. Good evening, Machete Falls. This is me, Roger News, from News Control. And special shout out to this episode's ad for Lisa Mattresses, which featured Paul doing an impression that I'm still hoping will come back someday. Oh, hi, audience. It's me, Tommy Wiseau, here to tell you about Lisa. Number 11. Episode 51, Tesla Charging Station. Keegan-Michael Key takes the Largo stage and is asked about something he hasn't told his parents, and it's a question he simply can't answer. We've been talking for six minutes and I haven't <laughs> answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> but it still leads to amazing stories from his youth. Then Keegan and Paul join Craig Kukowski, Chris Tallman, and Jean Villapique for a story that begins at a Tesla charging station, but soon heads all over the map. Take me to the closest Tesla charging station. <laughs> I think you said Cracker Barrel. <laughs> the focus of the story starts on Keegan as a fugitive, but the focus quickly shifts when Chris makes the bold choice to do this. <laughs> and Jean has the perfect reaction with this. That's our daughter, Carolyn. <laughs> and that leads to this. She likes you. Hello, Carolyn. <laughs> oh, and also Hannibal Lecter shows up. Is there any way to make that lamp be silent? <laughs> there are many great comedians who believe that comedy can only come from a place of 
darkness of suffering or anger or pain, and it's true that that can yield great comedy, but one of the things I really appreciate about Paul F. Tompkins and his colleagues is the joyousness in their comedy. They just have so much fun making each other laugh and making themselves laugh, and Keegan-Michael Key fits into that mindset perfectly. He is so delighted to be playing, and that delight is infectious. And so ends part one of my list of my favorite episodes of my favorite podcast. Be sure to come back for the top ten, and in the words of a wise man, goodbye forever, until next week.